April 16, 1945. The final Soviet assault on the capital of the Third Reich has begun. With an estimated population of some two and a half million people, Berlin is about to receive the biggest attack in its history. Many fans wonder how it is possible that other smaller cities could have endured sieges of weeks, months, and even years, while the so-called Fortress of Berlin fell in about 15 days if we count from the start of the Soviet offensive, or in just 10 or 11 if we take into account only the time of urban combat. And it is that cities like Stalingrad, the Soviet Sebastopol, Bratislav, the Kurland Stock Exchange, or can among many others, held out for months, and after all, it was what could be expected in Berlin. However, it didn't happen. Although the Soviets began their attack in mid-April, the German capital was under threat from the end of January, when the Red Army reached the banks of the Oder. This means that the Germans had about two and a half months to prepare their defenses, and theoretically ensure that the battle for the city could drag on for months. These defensive constructions around their capital began in an accelerated manner during mid-January, in the face of the Soviet threat. In a matter of days, a series of trenches were erected on the outskirts of Berlin, and some anti-tank obstacles were set up. Obviously, these defenses would have been a joke if the Soviets had decided to attack at that time. In any case, the so-called Berlin Fortress had its birth here, even if it was only on paper. Thus, the main problem that the Germans had, this being the first point of the program, is that they no longer had the necessary number of soldiers to occupy these defensive positions. Despite the fact that when talking about this battle, the spectacular figures are usually given that the Germans had almost 800,000 soldiers for the defense of Berlin, this figure is completely misleading. The reality was that most of these troops, including virtually all experienced veteran soldiers, were on the banks of the Oder at the time of the attack. Once the German defenses were overcome, most of them did not enter Berlin. As we saw in the program on Halby's encirclement, more than 200,000 soldiers were surrounded south of Berlin, and did not participate in the defense of the city. Another important number of troops withdrew to the northwest with Steiner, and they did not defend Berlin either. And finally General Helmuth Weidling was one of the few who withdrew to Berlin with his 56th Panzer Corps, which in reality was not made up of more than a handful of battalions worn out after the battle. In any case, and to conclude this first point, we have to emphasize that it was not until the appointment of Lieutenant General Helmuth Raymond, when the defensive rings both outside and inside Berlin began to be conscientiously built. In addition, and as Raymond himself pointed out, the most worrying thing was not the poor and scarce material with which these defensive lines could be equipped in a hurry, but the lack of soldiers trained to occupy them. When push came to shove, they ended up as newly recruited soldiers during the Luthen project, elders from the Volkstrom and children from the Hitler Youth, who had to bear the brunt of the urban battle for Berlin, facing a very veteran army that vastly outnumbered and material. Without a doubt, Many of them were highly motivated and wreaked havoc among the Soviet troops, using weapons such as the Panzerfaust or their MG-42 machine guns, which are very effective in urban combat. But in general terms, seniority, cohesion, and organization give greater strength. The last veteran armies of Germany were far from Berlin, and could not defend their capital, as were the 200,000 men trapped in Kurland the half a million who ended up surrendering a few days later in the vicinity of Prague, the 400,000 soldiers from northern Italy, and some 800,000 remaining who had withdrawn to the northwest of Berlin under the new Donitz government. Even if many of these men could have defended Berlin, the question is, what good would it have been? With a totally exhausted Germany, without industrial production and without any type of fuel or ammunition supply, what impact would it have had if the defense of Berlin could have been extended until mid-May? Having seen the precarious situation in which the German defenders found themselves, let's go to point number two in which we are going to focus on the attacking Soviet force. The Red Army spared nothing when it came to delivering its final blow. More than two million soldiers, along with 6,300 main battle tanks, 7,500 aircraft, and 40,000 artillery pieces, were prepared to pounce on the German defenses. However, what gave them their quick victory was not their numbers, nor their seniority, 
nor their abundant material, but the intensity and fury with which they carried out the attack. Although in another type of context the attacks on the cities are carried out with caution, and avoiding suffering many casualties among your soldiers, this time it was not like that. Of course, it was also not decided to surround the city and let it end up falling like ripe fruit, as it used to be done in most cases as well. This time a maximum period had been given in which the city would have to be completely taken, this being the 1st of May, such a symbolic date for the Soviet Communist Party. In order to achieve this, the number of casualties that had to be ordered did not matter. Thus, the Battle of Berlin became a real hell, in which hundreds of thousands of soldiers charged from all directions, making use of the greatest possible firepower, with the sole objective of reaching the Reich Chancellery as soon as possible. In the end, nearly 350,000 soldiers lost their lives during this fast-paced operation. This means that if it had been any other conventional assault, the rate of advance would have been slower, and the fighting for Berlin would have lengthened significantly despite this abysmal difference between the soldiers and material on each of the sides. The third item on the program, this being another of the peculiar reasons for the rapid fall of Berlin, which practically only occurred in this urban combat, was the lack of reinforcements and supplies of any kind. When we think of some other urban combat such as the battle for Stalingrad, either at the moment in which the Germans attacked or defended, the defender always counted on an arrival of supplies, no matter how small. To give a few examples, both Chukov's Soviet 62nd Army that was besieged in the city with the Volga at its back, or the German 6th Army when it was surrounded after Operation Uranus, were receiving a more or less constant flow of supplies that they were allowed to continue fighting. This was repeated in the Kurland region, Sebastopol, Wroclaw, Demyansk, and on practically every occasion in which a contingent of troops was isolated. Of course it also happened in those cities that were located on the front line and were under attack without being surrounded, such as Kenorakan. On the contrary, in Berlin, once it is completely surrounded on April 23rd and 24th, and its southern airport falls into Soviet hands, the air supply it receives is practically nil and does not have any kind of impact. In addition, with all the fronts collapsed, and all its industrial fabric in enemy hands, its production during that month of April was negligible. Although there were some material depots scattered throughout the heart of Germany, these had long since been practically emptied to shore up the front lines. Thus, the material that was still available had great difficulties to be transported due to the total lack of fuel and means of transport, since the German railways were completely crushed. All these points were what ultimately made a city as big as Berlin end up falling in such a short time. Within each of these three keys there are many others that we have not focused on in depth, but if you are interested in this subject, I leave you in the description the program on the defensive rings of Berlin, in which we see with great luxury detail the defenses that the Germans had. On the other hand, you also have the program that we recorded with Daniel Ortega about this battle, in which we also carried out an in-depth analysis. We say goodbye here. Thank you all for being part of this community, and especially the sponsors who make this possible. Subscribe and share this program if you liked it, and we'll see each other here as always, next Wednesday and Sunday. See you soon.